Hey, yo, hey everyone, Andrew here, bringing you another video review. Today we're going to be doing my comic load for the week, as well as news, updates, and questions and answers, and everything that falls in between. As you can see, I'm trying to get back onto a more consistent basis with my videos, putting them out weekly, and by doing so, I want to get back to the way things were when it came down to my general comic load video, which was talk about the comics, talk about any news or updates that have come up, not only in the comic book world, the geek world, the video game world, but with myself, and also doing questions and answers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the few select questions I actually had in the previous few videos, talk about them here, and if you have a question for my next video, post it down below, I answer all questions. So, uh, with that said, uh, also, if you notice, uh, I'm going to adjust the camera a bit, uh, I'm wearing my uh, Goku, or it's more Master Roshi shirt, Goku wears it because he's part of the Turtle School, but uh, I've been wearing it today, and I, can, I, I can't remember, but I... I feel like I've worn this before in some other videos. Uh, probably because I always wear this to the gym. Because if I'm going to power up, I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be rocking some Saiyan armor, some Saiyan clothing, some Saiyan attire. But I just found that funny because as I was getting ready to do this video, I just got back from the gym. Like, geez, while well, my mom's out, uh, my wife's out doing Father's Day for her father, and I have some time to do the video. But do I really want to get changed? to stay in the uh, gym gear and uh, might as well be rocking the Goku. That's because I've been rocking Dragon Ball Z like a mofo. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I went through all of Dragon Ball Z, rewatched it, some episodes I've seen, some episodes I didn't. I've been trying to watch a lot of Dragon Ball, but I haven't had an opportunity to, and I've been keeping up on Super, so I can't wait till they actually translate Super and dub it, but we have some time before that happens, but I've been watching a lot of Dragon Ball Z, been loving it. Uh, also, with that said, I can't help but feel like I need to apologize. Last video when I talked about Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, I kept on saying Breath of the Wind, probably because I was listening to Pocahontas, uh, Colors of the Wind, or maybe it's just because I worked a 14-hour day and I was mad tired. Either case, I was an idiot. We'll move on. So let's get into comic books, and we're going to start where we always start, with a little bit of Batman in our life, with Batman issue number one, the actual start to the new Batman series. Uh, stepping off from Rebirth, uh, basically Batman's doing what he does, being a badass, protecting Gotham, talking to Commissioner Gordon, but while this is happening, a plane gets shot down by a missile, and as the plane is going down, Batman, with help from Duke and... Alfred, uh, calculate the best way to try to save this airplane. I'm not going to go into details on how he saves this airplane, but basically it involves the Batmobile, an injection sheet, and a lot of balls. Big bat balls. Um, like balls to do what he had to do. But anyways, uh, with that said, there's a bit of a twist of the end with an introduction of new characters, which you can actually see on the cover. Uh, you see those co uh, characters here. That's Gotham and Gotham Girl. Batman's on the cover. You got James Gordon. And right here, we got Duke Thompson. Uh, which we, I still don't think we've got an official name for what his identity is going to be. Uh, good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good. This is an excellent starting and jumping on point for uh, Batman fans. Fantastic. If you're just jumping into Rebirth, whether you're a new fan to comics or if you're an old DC fan that left with uh, New 52, if you're going to jump on, here's a place to go. Very new reader friendly. Um, David Finch's art is very good, and what I particularly like about David Finch's art is he does the new Batman costume the best. Now, I've gone on record that my favorite Batman costume was the New 52 Batman costume. Basically, it did everything perfect, and the fact that they changed it, I don't see why. They didn't change Flash's costume or Green Lantern's. They really didn't change Aquaman's because you really didn't need to. Those costumes are the perfect rendition of those characters. Superman, I can understand changing, and Wonder Woman, it's okay to change her up. They improved for the most part with their costumes, but Batman, giving him the yellow outline, the cape that doesn't split here so you can't have it cover him but splits out the shoulders and also having the you know the black belt and the the purple uh, cape I, I just didn't like it uh, well I didn't hate it but it's just going from the best 
to something new. It just it didn't rub me the white way. Right. But David Finch draws the suit beautifully, uh, beautifully, beautifully, um, and it's probably because he basically takes a new Fifty Two suit and just changes those minor differences with the. Uh, with the color of the cape, the belt, and the bat symbol. Um, but he, he makes me uh, accept the suit for what it is. So, uh, on a whole, I think he did a very good job with that. Um, I also liked the vulnerability I get from this on Batman. Like, it's not Batman going up and saving the day and thinking he's going to save the day and everything's going to go good. The point is that Batman thinks he's going to die and he actually tells Alfred, like, hey, tell people to do X, Y, and Z when I'm gone. I hope my parents love what I did. Uh, do you think they're proud? Like, it's kind of a nice vulnerable moment for Batman. Uh, bad. The only, I won't even say this is a bad, but what I will say is the fact that this did nothing to explosively wow me. Um, it was good, it was nice, it was fresh, great dialogue, overall enjoyable experience, but nothing blew me away. There wasn't anything that just had that moment. Um, with that said, I'm going to give this a uh, 4.5 out of 5. Uh, solid issue, uh, definitely a must get. Moving on to Superman Rebirth, issue number one. Uh, so, basically, this is more of a uh, John Kent Superman Sons comic than a Superman. Because uh, the POV, the point of view for this, is through Superman's son. Uh, there's some pretty interesting moments that happen, like how he reacts with his powers, and uh, him spying on his father... Uh, but that's basically the gist of it. It's kind of his son dealing with the fact that he has these superpowers and his dad is Superman. Uh, good. Uh, there's one moment in this which is a tragic moment where um, basically John Kent's powers go awry and he does something that is just super sad. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman have a discussion, although you don't actually hear the discussion. It's nice to see the three of them kind of talking and still seeing, you know, Two parts of the Trinity, skeptical of who the Superman is. Uh, the art is really good in this, and the dialogue is solid. Bad. I didn't like the fact that it was a point of view from John Kent. This is Superman. It should be his point of view, if anything. Um, if I want John Kent's point of view, I'll go and read Super Sons, which I am going to read because I read everything DC. But um, I have no problem with John Kent being an epiphical role in this because this Superman is a super dad. But I really think it should have been from the point of view of Superman because it's it's his comic. I'm not reading this for John. I'm reading it for Superman. Um, so in addition to that, I felt as though the plot was not there. I mean, I get the idea. It's like, oh, my dad's Superman. Something's happening. But at the same time, it's like there's no threat that's being established. There's no overarching story that's being established. Maybe that'll happen in the second issue, but it's not enough to grab me in this one. I am going to settle with a 3 out of 5 on this. Uh, still good. Better than average. Average is 2.5. But with that said, uh, could have been much better. Let's move on to Titan's Rebirth, issue number one, or one shot. This is the actual Rebirth issue, not issue number one. Uh, Wally West is back, and he's better than ever. Um, honestly, I think this is probably one of the best interpretations of Wally, but I'll get into that when I talk about the actual good, bad, and whether or not you should get it. Wally is back, and he's gone to the old Titans hangout. I can only assume it's the old Titans hangout. And uh, there he meets up with Dick, who Dick is like, who the hell are you, and what are you doing here? So he attacks him, because, you know, what's the best way to saying hi to someone than attacking them? And Wally does the most manly thing ever, uh, you know, gives him a loving, shocking hug, well, it's not really a hug, he shocks him by mistake with the Speed Force, and by doing so, Dick starts to remember who Wally is, and the rest of the Titans show up, and the same thing ensues, it's just them attacking him, and then like, oh shit, this is Wally, and they all start to remember each other, and embrace with each other, um, which is the basic start of this issue, Wally joins back up with the team, and he basically says to them, something has gone on, someone has screwed with our universe, Titans together, Let's figure this out, um, which is awesome. Let's go into the good, the bad, and whether or not you should get it. Uh, good, back into talking about Wally. Um, I think this look for Wally, this persona for Wally, is really good. I, I don't think he has a code name yet, although I think he's still being called The Flash. Uh, but this makes Wally stand out because Wally being The Flash was great for the 20 years he was Flash, but he was still someone else's identity. 
But here, he's like his own Nightwing. He's stepping out of the shadow of Barry, but being his own man and being his own persona, which is what I like. I know one day when Barry dies and when Bruce dies that eventually Nightwing will become Batman and and uh, Wally will become the Flash again. But with that said, I like the fact that this is his own persona and it fits very well into the Titans sphere. A lot of emotional moments in this and really well done emotional moments with Wally reconnecting with the team. What I particularly like about this is the fact that, well, it's for the most part the original Titans team. What do I mean by that? Well, there's been different segments of the Titans team throughout the years and different members, but there's always been kind of core raw. So you have the original Titans, you have the new Teen Titans, uh, then you have the Titan Titans, and then you have the Jeff John Teen Titans, and then, well, it kind of goes crazy from there. But, for the most part, I always said that the best Titans book has always been George Perez, Marv Wolf, and New Teen Titans. And I've always said it's been one of the best teams. Uh, if you want some of the best comic book experience that you'll ever have, read those. Get the archive editions or get the individual issues. They're fantastic. But with that said, many of the Titan teams aren't here. Cyborg has, you know, graduated to being a founding member of the Justice League. Starfire is kind of, you know, teaching the Teen Titans and never really being a member of this team. And uh, Raven and Changing, or Beast Boy, have been de age and are part of the Teen Titans team. Uh, they do not have history with the original Titans. Uh, what I particularly like about this is it makes me love this team because it is the original Titans. The original Teen Titans was Donna Troy, Dick Grayson, Wally West, and Garth eventually speedy and you have them here and eventually Liv came on and marv came on and hawk and dove but uh this i get that feeling of this original team coming back together i read everything dc and as much as i would have liked the kind of a new teen titans team i think this works better because the 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 newer teen titans team or the new teen titans new characters that got brought in cyborg raven beast boy and um, Starfire have all gone off and done their uh, other things. They're, they're in a different point in their life. I like the fact this is Garth and Arsenal and Donna and Wally and Dick and Lilith. The only complaint I can have with this is Lilith. Not with the character, with her costume. It is god awful ugly. It's like Moon Knight wearing green. It just looks silly. Um, putting that aside, uh, this is a solid issue. Five out of five. Great jumping on point for people, and it's great to see this Titan teams back together. Keep the team as is. I would have thrown Guardian on there, but that's just me. But fantastic. Uh, definitely a highlight of Rebirth. Let's talk about another highlight of Rebirth, uh, Green Arrow. So, uh, in this, Imiko shows back up his sister, or his half-sister, that um, his father and uh, Shadow had together. And uh, basically, he's working with Black Canary and his sister to take down these uh, creepy abductor things. They're like ghouls, but they abduct people. I don't know the name for them yet. And uh, while this is going on, you know, we get a little bit of this with Black Canary and Green Arrow. And at the same time, Black Canary is challenging Green Arrow on his position in life. Um, what he does and how he does things. And there's a shocking twist at the end of this book. Uh, good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Good. Um, you, you notice I'm talking about Ollie's sister a lot, and I really like how she's being portrayed here. The character was great when she was introduced in the um, New 52 under the Jeff Lemire run and was expanded on in the most recent one, but here she feels more like a character. And just the little time that she had her, uh, she, she feels a little bit more expanded upon. What I also think they did and that maybe they snuck this in, but you get a kind of feeling that she's a mix between the Imiko that we had from New 52, as well as Thea Queen from Arrow. She kind of has Thea's haircut, and Thea's uh, sharp remarks, so I feel like it's a blend of the two characters, which I welcome. Um, the relationship with Black Canary and Green Arrow has done great here. They bang, but they're not, like, in a relationship, and I think that's what is great about this. It's not like they built upon something like a friendship and then into a relationship and then they start banging. It's like they are just attracted to each other. They bang, but they know they're not boyfriend and girlfriend. They're kind of like, you know, I don't even know you. You're hot, but like we need to get to know each other. And it's kind of cool to see that relationship kind of build with this direction. It's a terrible way to start a relationship. I mean, 
for the most part. I know people that have banged first and then now have a long-standing relationship, but usually relationships need to have foundation. And that foundation isn't your cock and your, your vagina. So, anyways, with that said, a uh, uh, twist at the end was really good. The art is really good. Bad none. This series actually hooked me really well with the great secondary characters, which is something that Green Arrow definitely needs, uh, with the great betrayal of Ollie, and with the great betrayal of uh, Black Canary. This is really great, and the shocker at the end, I want to read more. Five out of five. Um, Green Lantern. So, Baz and um, Jessica are basically working together. There's a big murder going on, in Intruder alert, alien on Earth that shouldn't be there, and they go to investigate. And eventually people start having fits of rage, and by doing fits of rage, they explode. Shit gets everywhere, with that shit being blood, and we find out Atrocitus and Belize are behind it, which they should, like, they're right there. And LaFreeze! LaFreeze, you should come into the comic instead of just being on the cover. Uh, so yeah, it's basically the two of them trying to figure out how to work things out, and also dealing with the fact that the Red Lanterns are growing and becoming powerful, and yada yada yada. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good, Jessica and Simon are kind of a great buddy cop combination. I like the bickering with each other, and I like them trying to learn how to work with each other. I also particularly like how they're Green Lanterns that really don't know what to do. They're rookies, so they make mistakes. I do like the fact that they're bringing uh, the Red Lanterns back to their cultish, blood magic, kind of like crazy religion kind of tone that they had. But the bad is, is that so much happens in this book and is condensed down so much um, that it, it can be a little overwhelming when reading. You might need to do a second read. In addition to that, this is definitely, uh, I don't feel as though this is as new reader friendly as the Rebirth issue was. Um, still good read, 4 out of 5, recommend picking it up, enjoying it. Let's, uh, let's step away from DC for a little bit, let's move into a, a bit of Marvel with uh, two Star Wars titles. Uh, Star Wars issue number 20, this is a flashback issue, basically when Luke is probably a preteen, um, and it continues the, the theme of, um, and I forget this guy's name, the, the, the uh, black Wookiee, Black Kanisha, Kanishan, or whatever his name is. Um, basically, he attacks Lars Owen, um, and Obi-Wan goes to save him. And there's a duel and a fight that goes on here, and Luke plays a part. I don't want to reveal too much of the plot, but that's the basic gist. Um, good, bad, whether or not you should get it. The art in this was really good. I, I don't know if it was someone tracing over people's faces like, Gre uh, what's his name, Greg Land or whatever his name is does, um, but it really helped the story out very well. Uh, and it was a very animated story, which was nice. Um, Obi-Wan wasn't ultimate badass uh, Jedi here. He did have some trouble, but it was still good to see him fight. And I got a really good sense of this being kind of like Obi-Wan, Hugh McGregor from uh, Revenge of the Sith. Like, the posture and the, the way that he talked. So they did a good job at capturing the characters. Bad? None. This is actually a really good, like, individual one-shot issue. If you want just a good Star Wars story and you don't want to really commit to the, the, the comic itself, pick this up. I think you'll enjoy it thoroughly. Um, but, with that said, Star Wars, the main comic, has been 60% good, 40% boring. Like, the last story, the Rebel uh, Prison one, I didn't care about it. But this kind of picks it back up and makes it interesting again. So it's kind of interesting how this comic is working. Uh, but definitely a good read. Something that you can pick up that's a one-shot. And let's talk a little bit more Marvel with a little bit more Star Wars. Han Solo issue number one. Now originally this wasn't in my pull list because I forgot about it. Um, but the basic gist of this is sometime after the Battle of Yavin. Uh, Han is off doing his thing, trying to make money and pay off Jabba the Hutt when Leia sends people after him and said, Yo, bro, bro, I'm going to need your uh, Millennium Falcon for something. And he says, What do you need my Millennium Falcon for? I'm not going to get into the reasons for it, but basically he has to enter into a death race. And Han's like, You know what? That's Gucci. I'll do it. Uh, so Han enters into this death race to help out uh, Princess Leia in the Rebel Alliance. Uh, good. Um, you definitely get a Han Solo, Harrison Ford feel with this. The writing was spawned on. The art was actually really good. 
uh, very true to the characters and some of the best Star Wars art we've had in a while. And the concept of the story is really good, too. Bad? I can't think of any bad. This is going to be another 5 out of 5. Um, if you're a big Han Solo fan, pick it up. It's definitely worth it. Um, I was thoroughly surprised of this. Uh, let's move on back to DC for a moment to Justice League issue number 51. This is a flashback issue, but with ties to Rebirth, uh, particularly Titan's Rebirth. And basically this is set some point after the invasion from Darkseid. And Batman introduces Dick Grayson at the time, who is Robin, uh, to the Justice League. And basically he says, hey, I want... Robin to be on this mission for us to figure things out. Most of the Justice League members are like, really? You're having the kid join in on this mission? Are you sure? Where did he come from? Why didn't you introduce him to us sooner? Yada, yada, yada. Insert bickering here. Um, the only one that's really welcoming is, uh, is Cyborg, which is understandable because, well, Cyborg's kind of a kid of himself. At this point, I think Dick is like 17-ish. And Cyborg has to be 18 or 19 because he's relatively in college or would have been in college. So there's not much of an age difference. Uh, so they go off to fight these monsters and um, and yeah, that's the basic gist of it. Uh, it ties a bit into Titan's Rebirth, but I'm not going to tell how it ties into Titan's Rebirth. Uh, good. Um, it's great to see the original team together working. I love this team. I love Hal Jordan, Barry Allen, Arthur Curry, Clark Kent, Diana Prince, Vic Stone, and Bruce Wayne, the core seven working together. I long for the day that Hal Jordan is a consistent member on the Justice League. I don't know why they consistently swap him out for different Green Lanterns. I mean, I get it, but he should be on the team. It, it, it's... It's refreshing, and he's my favorite Green Lantern, so I'm a little biased towards that. But more importantly, it's it's natural to have Robin join part of the join the Justice League temporarily. Uh, why is it natural? Well, why not? He's Bruce Wayne's sidekick. Uh, Robin has always been part of the Justice League or joined in on their cases from time to time. Whether it's been the Silver Age or whether it's been on the Super Friends show or whether it's been on any adaptation of the, the Justice League cartoon. You know, well, maybe not so much a cartoon, but it just feels natural for Robin to be there, if anything, as an observer. Uh, and it's kind of cool how Dick plays his part. I love the dialogue in this issue, and I particularly like at the end, which I'm going to spoil something, so spoiler alert, at the end of them, Crisis is resolved, and Bruce basically talks to Dick, and Dick tells him, you know, I'm way over my head in this. Like, I was way over my head, outclassed, like, why did you bring me? And Bruce said, you know, I want you to get used to this. I want you to understand that, you know, like me, if you don't have powers, you can still be an important part of the team. And you were. You saved the day. I want you to get used to being part of the Justice League. And then t uh, Dick says, so wait, you're saying one day I'm going to be a member of the Justice League? And then Batman responds, no, one day you're going to lead the Justice League. It's just a cool moment because it shows Bruce's confidence in Dick, but also shows the difference in the relationship between Batman and his Robins. For example, Jason, Bruce's relationship with Jason was very much like, I relate to this kid, I want to help this kid out, and then it's, he's a little bit more, f you know, free-spirited with Jason, and then Jason dies, and obviously that affects him, but it also affects his relationship because it's a, it's a, it's a, dark mark on Batman's life. It's something that he's never forgives himself for. With Tim, he's overly protective of Tim because of what happens with Jason. Um, so that relationship is very strained. With Damien, it's a relationship of love, but a relationship of two heads budding because they're father and son, and they're very different in personality. But what I really love about Dick and Bruce's relationship, despite the bumps that they have, and they do have bumps, it's the fact that Bruce truly believes that Dick is better than him, and one day he's going to be the best. Uh, whether or not that's the case, that's up to debate. But he believes wholeheartedly in his partner, and he believes in what Dick represents. That's why, out of all the relationships Bruce has that have crumbled and fallen and rebuilt and all that, the one that has been relatively stable has been him and Dick. 
yes, they did fight when he had first become Nightwing, but even Bruce and Dick admit to the fact that it's a, you know, it's a, a strain in a relationship that they had to have because Dick had to become his own man. Yeah, they bickered and moaned every once in a while, like Bruce when he became a fugitive in the Batman, Bruce Wayne Wanted series. Uh, but again, it's, it's, you know, people are going to have fights every once in a while. But they've always been true. Like, Dick Grayson is the one person that Bruce can always go to and trust. And I, I, and I know I'm maybe overanalyzing it, but it's, again, a testament to their relationship. Bad, the only bad I can say is the, the laws and physics of fighting some of these bad guys was stupid, particularly the wolves. Flash has trouble hitting them, but Batman can hit them. Seems kind of weird. Uh, despite that, I'm still going to give this a 5 out of 5. It is an enjoyable issue, and maybe it's playing towards my likes more than anything, because I like this core 7 Justice League team. I like Dick on there with being Robin. I love this kind of, this era, this feel. Um, in addition to that, it shows that some of the DC comics that haven't quite hit Rebirth are still viable good comics. Five out of five. And a good one-shot issue. But if you're reading Titans, I recommend it. Moving on to Suicide Squad, issue number 21. Uh, so I'm going to be really brief with this. Although I love the Suicide Squad and I'm eagerly awaiting the new Rebirth series. And eagerly awaiting the uh, the new movie coming out in August. August? August. Uh, I didn't care for this issue and I didn't care for the story. The dialogue was good. The action was good. The interrelationships was good. But the story really wasn't interesting. I was confused sometimes. I didn't really latch on to it. I kind of skipped some stuff because I just didn't care. Um, with that said, it's, this wasn't a bad issue. It was good resolve. I'm going to give it a, a 2 out of 5. Um, I feel as though we just need new breath brought into the uh, Suicide Squad. And I think it's going to happen with Rebirth. Um... Continuing, uh, two more DCs, and then we'll go back outside of DC, and then we'll we'll finish things off. Uh, we'll do Poison Ivy, Psycho, Life and Death. This is issue six of six. This is the final issue of this, and basically it resolves the whole story of the seedling children that Poison Ivy have going out uh, up against this monster named the Grim. Uh, a surprise addition from Swamp Thing. I'm going to spoil that. Swamp Thing shows up. Uh, but it's basically the end of the story. I don't want to reveal too much because I don't want to spoil the story. So let's just jump in the good and bad and whether or not you should get it. Uh, art is fantastic. Dialogue is great. Uh, Swamp Thing showing up was nice. And what I particularly like about this is this continues a trend that has been happening with the Batman villains. The older Batman villains tend to go into two directions more recently. Villains like Joker, Scarecrow, Two-Face have gone in the direction that they are getting crazier, darker, and more evil. As opposed to villains like Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, Riddler back in the day, before New 52, but not anymore, Catwoman have gone on to the position of either neutral or anti-hero. By no way, shape, or form is Pamela Isley a, a hero or a good guy. She's not. She's very selfish. She she believes in just you know nature and and protecting the green and all that stuff. But she's not a bad person either. I feel as though she's kind of becoming that, I wouldn't even say anti-hero that Harley Quinn is now, but more of kind of just plain, flat old neutral. And I, I like the change with the character because she was getting boring as a villain. Uh, bad. Uh, it ends very abruptly, and I don't feel as though there's much closure in the ending. Uh, it leaves things hanging. I wanted closure. Uh, it did go a different direction than I thought, but I, I still would have liked a little bit of closure. On a whole, 4 out of 5. If you've been picking up this series, I recommend finishing it. Um, and I feel as though it might read better in trade, but that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about a series that really ended very well, as opposed to kind of left things standing, and that's the Swamp Thing 6-issue miniseries. Uh, so Len Wein is jumping back on, on Swamp Thing, telling his story, because he's one of the creators of Swamp Thing, and um, basically, this resolves Swamp Thing getting his powers back and working with all the mystics of the DC Universe, the powerhouses, Spectre, uh, Phantom Stranger, uh, Zatanna, 
a, the demon Etrigan show up in this. Um, but basically, it kind of resolves this story, and it does it in a fantastic way, uh, which I will get into the good, the bad, and whether or not you should get it. The art is uh, really good, and it's very monster-like, and I like it. Even though some of the characters, like I think Zatanna looks a little silly, I, I really do like how Swamp Thing looks in this. I like how Spectre looks in this. I loved how the demon looked in this. The art had that very grim and, like, horror-ish, like, look. Uh, this does a very good character building on uh, Alec Holland as Swamp Thing and how far he's willing to go to be a hero and to do the right thing. Uh, the only bad I can say about this is that the true villain of this was revealed and it was a little bit cliche. I'm going to have to do this because I, I, the second I knew there was a greater power at work at this, I'm like, oh, it's going to be this dude. And it was this dude. I won't reveal who. Uh, but in saying that, this was a really good series. Individual issue-wise, I don't recommend picking it up. But when this comes out on trade, I do recommend getting it. Whether you're a Swamp uh, Thing fan or not, I think it does a lot good as a standalone story. Uh, bringing elements from way back in the day, from the 80s and the early 90s, to the New 52 and, and kind of pouring it together. DC's mission statement with this, with Poison Ivy, with Katana, with... Um, uh, Firestorm and the Legends of Tomorrow was to kind of you know bring the characters back to their roots, but not forgetting what has been done with them. And I think Swamp Thing did it the best. Uh, good issue. I'm going to give this a 4 out of 5 also, just because cliche ending, but um, reads really good. I think that's going to read good in trade, so get in trade. Uh, let's move on to Deja Thoris, issue number 5. Damn, Deja, you're still in the freaking desert trying to figure things out. And that's what's killing me about this series. Uh, the series started off so good, and I feel as though it's just been meandering around. Uh, stuff happens in this, but I don't care, because she's still kind of doing the same thing she was doing in issue 4, in is issue 3, and in issue 2. Um, I would like the plot to move forward a bit more. I'm going to give this a 2 out of 5. Be better, Deja. Be better. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, issue number 59. Do you like Splinter? I like Splinter. Who doesn't love Spink, uh, Splinter? He's a radical rat. Um, so, with that said, this is a flat-out Splinter issue. The Turtles are only in the beginning of it and the end of it. But, uh, with that said, this is Splinter kind of doing his day-to-day -day stuff, having a great uh, dialogue with Kitsu, who is the uh, fox lady sorceress that Shredder has. Just really great dialogue. And that's what it is. This has some fantastic dialogue in it. And we're going to go into that good and bad right now. Fantastic dialogue. I really love kind of the war of words between Kitsu and uh, Splinter in this. And Splinter talking to that, that female blonde guard that's guarding the shrine of Shredder. And even his overall thoughts on Shredder, which was very interesting. Because despite the fact that they were enemies, there was a huge mutual respect between the rat and the Shred. Uh, so that was really good. And this is just amping up the internal struggle with the Foot Clan right now. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has been a consistently great series that has either been a 4 or 5 out of 5 stars comic. And this is a 5 out of 5 uh, issue. Get this issue and continue reading Turtles. Because it's fantastic. Uh, we're going to finish off, I'm just going to adjust in my seat, with the last three DC comics, but they're kind of out of continuity comics. Injustice, Gods Among Us, issue number 12, year 5. Don't worry, I'm going to be talking about Injustice to the video game, but let's talk about the comic. Victor Saz gets into Wayne Manor, and he gets really rough and dirty. Uh, a death happens. Spoiler, I won't say who, but you can probably figure it out. And Batman's out for blood. Yeah. Big time out for blood. But he's not the only one. Damian Wayne is out for blood too. And who is the one that sent Victor's ass to the Wayne Manor? Was it Superman? Was it Sinestro? Or was it someone else? We don't know. Uh, this issue was a really solid issue. Um, I think it did a good job with the pacing. I think the confrontation between Zaz and his victim was really good. And I enjoyed the ending too. Um... Consistency is what makes this book good, and that's why I've been enjoying the Injustice comic. There is no bad to this, but I feel as though if we're going to end year five, 
this is kind of an odd place to end it. Four out of five, enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Uh, Scooby Apocalypse, issue number two. Um, so, the Scooby team, the Scoobies, are going around and they're, they're trying to stop this apocalypse, this monster incursion from happening. We learn more about the characters, uh, particularly Velma, but um, we get to also see a little bit more uh, character moments from, um, oh god, what's her name? Jeez, uh, Daphne. I watch Scooby-Doo a lot. I don't know why I had that brain fart. But we got to see a lot more character dynamic with her, um, as well as some of the other characters. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good. I'm enjoying this kind of new take on the characters. I'm enjoying Scooby in this, and I'm really loving the, the, the moments in here. Particularly when Daphne had to shoot someone. That was pretty, pretty, pretty grim. Uh, the dialogue is pretty solid, if not too much of it, um, and the pacing is pretty good, too. And with that said, the only bad I could say is, while the dialogue is good, there's too much of it. Um, Dematis and Giffen are known for doing that. They love writing dialogue. And sometimes it plays very well to their strengths, but at the same time, pacing. That's, that's the thing that needs to be done in this. I'm going to give this a 4 out of 5. Um, still something worth picking up. It's fun. If you like Scooby, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, but at the same time, I, I again, if we shorten the dialogue down a bit, it, I think it would have been a little bit better. It would have got it at five. And rounding out this week would be Dark Knight Returns Last Crusade. Ever want to find out what happened, what caused Bruce to retire? Well, you're going to find out here. It's basically Bruce and Jason's last mission together. And I'm going to leave it at that with story. I don't want to reveal too much. Uh, so the good, the bad, and whether or not you should get it. The good. Uh, I think this does a good job at at balancing Bruce, younger Bruce, which we see in All-Star Batman and Robin, and older Bruce that we see in Dark Knight Returns. Because in All-Star Batman and Robin, he was a psycho. That wasn't Bruce Wayne. That was someone that was just off their rocker. To quote Linkara, Crazy Steve, or Bob, I think it's Steve. Um, but in this, it kind of touches upon that when he says, you know, I never enjoyed the fighting. Uh, I never enjoyed this war. And Alfred calls him out for that. He's like, you sure? Because back in that comic, you kind of enjoyed that shit. And he's like, I was young, I was stupid, I didn't know any better. Um, I think this does a good job at humanizing Bruce, making him more realistic, less crazy. Uh, it does a good job with Catwoman, too. An uh, interesting take on her. And uh, it's an interesting way on how Jason goes out, because he does go out. Um, good pacing, good story. The art was, was good. On whole, this is a solid read. Um, I will give this a 5 out of 5. So yeah, those those are the comics for the week. Pretty strong week. Had some had some comics that were in the twos and the threes, but for the most part, four and fives. If I had to say uh, a pick of the week, I'm tied between Titans and Green Arrow. I'm probably going to give it to surprisingly Green Arrow. I really thoroughly enjoyed this book. Titans was emotional and had probably some of the best moments, but for a comic that really needed rebirth, I think. Green Arrow did it better. Um, but um, I'm really loving what's going on in Green Arrow. I love the colors. I love the tone. I love the feel. I love the atmosphere. I love the characters. Uh, keep keep giving me it because it's, it's great stuff. Uh, with that said, let's talk about some updates. Uh, first of all, Happy Father's Day to all you out there that are fathers. It is my first Father's Day as a father myself. Um, probably the greatest honor... A man can have is being a father. Um, it's funny because I'll talk about fatherhood for a moment. When growing up, I was always kind of cautious about having children. Um, one, obviously, because I wasn't ready. Uh, B, I think I was very selfish when I was young. Not selfish, but I was very self centered. Not in a bad way, but I think we think a lot about ourselves rather than others when we're teenagers. Uh, another thing was, is like, you know, I, I, I had a lot of friends in high school who had kids in high school, uh, that got pregnant in high school, so I was, I was very, very cautious of that, because of, 
the beauty of having a child is amazing, but having it while in high school or when it's not prepared can throw a huge wrinkle in your life and can affect not only your life, but the life of the other parent and the life of the child. Like, it's a huge responsibility bringing a child in the world. So when I got, you know, my, my wife and I got together, when we started dating, we eventually, you talk about this shit, like I told her, like, I, I don't want to have a kid until we're in a good we have great jobs, we're married, and we're, we're in the right atmosphere because I want that child to grow up in the best situation possible. And, uh, you know, I had my son who was born in the morning at like 4 o'clock, I think. I, I, was, I was sleeping on the couch in the delivery room and the, <laughs> the doctor kind of poked at me. He's like, you're having a kid. I'm like, what? Shit, that kid's coming out now. But holding that child and getting to experience things with that child, with my son, has been some of the most rewarding things. And it gives you a huge perspective on the world. And I hate saying it like this because how many times have people told you that you do not understand until you become a parent? Well, you really don't. And it's, it's one of the most joyous and amazing things that can happen in life. So, happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Enjoy your day, enjoy your family, and enjoy the honor of being a father. Injustice 2 was revealed at E3, as well as a lot of other, you know, games like Zelda Breath of the Wind. I mean, wild. Um, but Injustice 2 looks to be good. We've only seen Gorilla Grodd, Atrocitus, Supergirl, Batman, Aquaman, um... We see Flash in the teaser trailer, but we don't actually see gameplay of him. But uh, it, it's looking to be fun. I love Injustice. I like the comic. I love the game. Like, my buddies and I still play it. It was a solid fighting game. And probably one of the best fighting games that include combo characters. I mean, it's I, I don't know if I would say it's better than Marvel... Actually, I would say it's up there with Marvel vs. Capcom. Um, just solid, solid game. And I'm, I'm interested to see how the armor aspect works out. I guess you can equip clothing um, to customize your character. Um, liking some of the movesets, you get to see some familiar moves from the characters, like Batman's grappling hook or Superman's up grab and throws him down. But you also get to see things differently. And I'm curious to see where the story is going to go from here. Because we know it's a continuation. At one point, Grog comes out and he's like, I'm going to rule the world! And Superman's like, no, I'm going to rule it. I already have. I'm going to do it again. So, kind of kind of cool. Um, really looking forward to that. Um, what I'm also going to start doing is when Flash, Arrow, Supergirl, and Legend of Tomorrow's come out, uh, come back out, I'm going to do episode reviews for them. Because I love those shows. And why not? Uh, I mean, do you guys want to see some episode reviews of these? I mean, they're, they're fantastic shows. Why not? Give my opinions. I kind of want to do it for Game of Thrones, but it's coming to the end of the series, so... What's the point? But who else is pumped for the Battle of the Bastards tonight? It's going to be on point. My boy, Jon Snow, better fuck Ramsay up. Because my boy, Jon Snow, War in the North. Or Secret Targaryen. Who knows? Uh, if you guys don't know, I'm, I'm, I love Game of Thrones. I came into it late. I never read the books, although I know a lot of the things that happen in the books because I go on a a wiki of fire and ice and I listen to podcasts there's one podcast that's just a Game of Thrones podcast I listen to so they talk a lot about the books my friend Doug um, he, he read the book so but I know a lot of what happens on the books but I, I binge watched the first five seasons and then I started watching season six um, and I just love it. Who it's such a fantastic show. My boy Tyrion's one of my favorite. I love Jamie Lannister. I love Jon Snow. Uh, Sansa Stark. I started liking her a lot more, especially over the character art that she's had and grown. Um, Daenerys is kind of cool, but I mean, there's there's so many characters, so many plot points, so many stories. It's just it's just fantastic. Uh, and then, video game-wise, what am I playing right now? I figured I'd give you guys an update on that. I've gone back to playing a little bit of Pokemon X and Y, uh, and Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, because the new Pokemon game coming out, Sun and Moon, and it's, you know, this happens with Pokemon for me. I get hardcore in Pokemon when it comes out. I play the shit out of it, capture every Pokemon, and yes, I do have every single Pokemon. I EV train the shit out of them. I level them up to 100. I do some competitive play, and then I just chillax. 
Uh, and then when I hear a new game comes out, I get back into it. And that's what kind of needs to happen with Pokemon. Like, I need to take a break from it. And then, it, you know, abs absence makes the heart grow fonder. Uh, so I'm playing a little bit of that, trying out some new teams and new combinations. Um, so yeah, I I'm really pumped for the new game to come out. But uh, Bravely Second is the game that I'm mainly playing. So once I beat the shit out of Bravely Second, I'm going to be happy. It's a great game, but I'm taking its strides. I did, however, play Uncharted 4 Among Thieves. Pound and Pound, I think it's one of the best Uncharted games. Get it. It is good. And it closes out that series with Nathan Drake perfectly. I'd like to see another Uncharted game with maybe someone different. But Nathan Drake, his story is told, and I love how it ended. Um, with that said, we're going to do a little bit of questions and answers. Oh, and I might as well tell you, uh, update was uh, the show that I'm binging right now is I'm watching a lot of DS9. Uh, with Star Trek, I've watched everything next gen. I've watched all the movies. I watched 90% of Voyager. Uh, but the original series, I watched maybe like 5% of it. So I'm going to watch that. But DS9, I've only watched maybe like 20% of it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to binge the shit out of this. And I'm going to get used to the show because this looks like it's a good show. Um, and so far, I'm only in the second season and I'm loving it. Still not TNG. TNG will always be my favorite because it has the best character on it, Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise, NCC-1701D or NCC-1701E, but I've been binging a lot of that. But um, with that said, let's, let's just get into questions and answers. So um, I'm just going to take a couple questions that, from the last two videos I put up for Comic Loads, um, and I'm going to jump into those because, A, there's not many questions that need to be I mean, you guys didn't post many, but mostly also, uh, you know, I need to get my feet wet again. I need to get shit going. But let's start things off. Um, Marcus asks, uh, do you have an opinion on all new, all different Marvel reboot, relaunch, rebrand? Um, I do not really have a good opinion. Um, my basic thoughts on Marvel lately is I'm a little tired. Like, I, I tried to get into Marvel. And with all new Marvel now, or with Marvel now, I kind of got into it with Cap, with Wolverine, with Thor, with Iron Man, with Avengers. And then I kind of fluttered away, and the only thing I really read was Wolverine and Captain. And I will always read Captain because he's motherfucking Captain America. He's my favorite Marvel character. But uh, what I don't like is how Marvel's rebranding and redoing a lot of things. Secret War 2. Civil War 2. And then... The re and please explain to me. It's like they destroyed the six one six universe, but they merged it with the ultimate universe. So six one six still happened, but ultimate characters are over there. So you have characters like Miles Morales, whose history is different, but he's on the six one six universe now. Or Old Man Logan, who just got thrust in the six one six universe, but he was never really part of it. It seems a little confusing to me. Um, what I can say is the thing that I do not like. And I'm going to say this. I don't like what's going on with Marvel right now. Because the characters I want to read aren't the characters there. I appreciate the fact that X-23 is Wolverine. But when I read Wolverine, I want to read Logan. I want to read my boy with the claws. Three claws, not two, and one on the foot. Uh, Thor. Nothing, nothing wrong with Thor being a female. But I want Odin's son. That's my boy. That is my boy. Uh, Iron Man's just... I, I can't get into Iron Man. I've tried. Like, he's an interesting character, but his... Yeah, I, I tried. Spider-Man is just not the Spider-Man I want. Captain America's finally back, being Steve Rogers. Nothing against Sam Wilson. I like Sam Wilson. He's a great cat, but he's not... He's not Captain. Um, so, I mean, I just don't... I don't feel the tone. I don't like the characters are in the position they are. So when Logan comes back, I'll read Wolverine. When Odin's son comes back as Thor, I might pick up Thor again. So, but you know what? That that's my general opinion on Marvel. They try to make uh, they're dominating the market. There's no denying that. But every time I try to get into it, like I just feel as though it's a struggle for me. And I understand that can be the case with DC for a lot of people too. So it's not maybe this just is just me being me, and I'm I'm a DC fanboy. But Marvel Now did a good job at bringing me in. All new, all different Marvel Now. The reboot, relaunching, whatever it is. Didn't do a good job. Because it's still confusing as fuck. 
Uh, so that, that's that's my general opinion. We'll see where Marvel goes from here. Uh, let's uh, let's take a look. Uh, um, that's not a question. Okay. No, that's that's still not a... Uh, okay, uh, Andrew, I'm glad to see you're uploading again back in... Um, and it's also great to know that everything's good at the home front. Also, if it helps uh, you any, you can take a video from an iPad and transfer it to your computer and upload it that way. But anyways, do you pick up, uh, plan on picking up all the Rebirth one-shots or just some of them? Um, I absolutely plan on picking up everything DC. Because it goes back to what I said. I'm a DC fanboy, so I'm going to pick it all up. Whether it's good or bad, I, I am. Um, I want to... Um, I definitely want to. I want to see where Rebirth is going and how it's going to affect the DC universe. Uh, sorry, I got a text from my wife. She wants to know if I want food. Uh, would you like us to get something from Grassfield? Uh, also, we uh, come over a little this after. Uh, I'll get back to her. But um, anyways, um, I always get everything DC. But I'm very interested to in see how Rebirth is going to affect the DC Universe. So yeah, I will pick up everything. Uh, Nick Lenz said, if you want to read Logan Wolverine, read Old Man Logan. It really helps. A uh, really good book. Also, it gives all new Wolverine a try. In the most recent issues, X-23 meets Old Man Logan. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm interested in just regular Logan, not Old Man Logan. Thank you for the suggestion, but I'm going to hold off because Old Man Logan's had a, a screwed up life. Um... Let's see. Let's answer. Okay, so those are the only questions from there. Let's go to the next one. Andrew, uh, nice haul. Uh, I'm thinking I'll. Uh, I think I'll wait to start getting rebirth stuff until they release trades. It's nicer that way. And also, do you think they should bring Silver Saint Cloud, whether it be in, uh, back, whether it be in the movies or the comics? I'm glad you asked that question. Let me talk about love interests. Because love is a beautiful thing. Uh, it makes our hearts spin. But most importantly, let's talk about love interests in comic books. Often I've had uh, debated on who would be the best love interest for Bruce. Um, because he had tons of them. From Vicki Vale to Julie Robinson um, to not Julia Robinson, but you know, it. Julia from Zero Year and from the Golden Age, uh, to Catwoman, uh, to possibly Black Canary. He had a thing with Black Canary back in the Silver Age, and it would have been interesting to see them get together in uh, New 52. To Talia Ghoul, like Bruce bangs a lot of chicks. But it would be nice to see Bruce has a stable relationship. What I would not give to have Silver St. Cloud not only be back in the New 52, but be back in the new 52. Well, be back in universe as a stable, consistent love interest for Bruce. Because without a doubt in my mind, Silver St. Cloud is the best relationship for Bruce. Catwoman has a close second, but she is a kleptomaniac and that does hurt her a bit. But, like, Silver St. Cloud is like, she loves Bruce. She understands what he's doing. And most importantly, it doesn't bother her. Like, she doesn't mind sitting at home waiting for him to come back. Like, she could be an interesting character. Make her like the new Oracle. Like, make her like be the tech person that's there that's helping out Bruce. Like, why not? Uh, but, I mean, she, all her stories have always been great. For Strange Aberrations, to, uh, was it, Dark, uh, Dark Detective, to Whiting Griner, or whatever it's called. Uh, all the stories that she's in are fantastic. And I enjoyed her in Gotham. Yes, I'm watching Gotham. Uh, I enjoyed her in Gotham. The, the the actress that played her, the kid actress that played her, did a very good job. I love Silver St. Cloud. I would love to see her back into the, the show. And even, uh, not the show, the comics, but even the movies. So um, that would have been good. And that's, uh, that's basically what we have for the uh, comic questions for this week. So if you have a question, post it down below. I will answer it in the next video. Um, and yeah, that's it. So with that said, this is Andrew saying peace out for now.